So we are live from Future Proof. Yeah. This week, which Thank is a fun. Thank you to the three of you that are here for us over Gunlock. That's very kind. I don't know that I would have made the same choice, but I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, we got the tough draw. We got we're up against Jeff Gunlock, who you know everybody came to see. So no one. Yeah, that's a good it's point. It's all good. All right. So, uh, Jake, you want to start with your segment because uh, Toby's over here trying to get the tech correct. <laughs> He's not ready. And uh, you are the one that comes prepared. So why don't you start this off? Sure. Let's uh, let's do some emergency veggies here. Uh, yeah. So I've actually been saving this one for a little while because I was, uh, you know, it's kind of a fun story. Um, so this is... Uh, from this book called Ship of Gold that my uh, friend Juan, who works at Schroeder, sent me. And it's a, it's a story about this ship from the 1850s that sunk uh, off the coast of North Carolina. And it happened to be full of people that were coming from 1849 gold rush in California. And so there was tons of gold on this, like approximately 30,000 pounds of gold on this ship when it went down. Uh, 425 of the 578 passengers didn't make it. And uh, so, but, and actually the, the gold that went down with the ship w contributed to the panic of 1857 because basically it was like shrinking the balance sheet of money effectively. Because hmm. uh, we were gold, st we were gold, gold standard. standard, right? So, and the ship sunk and it sat at the bottom of the ocean for 131 years before someone finally figured out how to get to it. And, uh, this fellow in 1987 named Tommy Thompson, who was a engineering whiz in, o in Ohio, uh, and he you know worked this normal job, but he was obsessed with deep sea technology and also uh, treasure hunting, basically. And he spent years studying this ship and you know where it might have gone. And eventually, he talked 160 investors into ponying up 12 million dollars to form an LP and go f search for this ship. Oh, that's and dope. Yes, and they used reports from survivors and other ships that were there to rescue people. And they were basically trying to triangulate using a bunch of different data points, including the physics of the ship, like where it would have planed down through the water 8,000 feet uh, to get to the bottom. And they created these probability density maps uh, that would, you know, they're really based on Bayesian search theory, uh, which we'll get into a little bit. Uh, and so they, they basically plotted out these maps in the Atlantic looking for where the ship might be. And then... They, they sent down this remote vehicle, which was basically like uh, this sled that had a, a sonar attached to it. And they're basically just pinging the bottom looking for any anomalies. And, you know, the, the ocean is pretty sparse for the most part there. And they found different ones that, that could have been it. And, you know, they, most of them were junk when they actually sent down the, the camera to look. But eventually they found this ship, the Central America, and they had to special build this vehicle to go down and, and uh, actually like scoop up all the, a bunch of gold. They bring it back up and they recovered a, a between 100 and 150 million dollars worth of artifacts and gold, huh. uh, which was only about 5% of what the ship probably went down with. And, but then in tw 2005, uh, a couple years to get like find it and they had to come back the next season to then like scoop it up basically. Uh, huh. And you said they they brought up what? They brought up gold. They brought up artifacts like yeah, the bells. Yeah, worth? Uh, about 100 to 150 million. Nice on a 12 million raise. So it gets a little interesting in okay. that uh, this guy Tommy Thompson uh, gets sued by the investors due to lack of returns. Like he he didn't give them any money. This he, gangster. And then he disappeared in 2012 and was on the lam until 2015. He was finally caught and brought back to Ohio to stand. Uh, stand justice, basically, and, uh, and he sat in a jail in Ohio in contempt of court to this day with, uh, because he won't tell them where the gold is. What? He's hid it somewhere, and he won't what tell them. What a fucking nut. He'd rather be in jail than, like... I think he left it for his kids. His That's insane. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Um, idiot. He says he can't remember where it went. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a good parable for value investing, that yeah. you do all of that work, you finally track the thing down. They end up in jail. Well, then the guy who, it's not there. You dig up the buried treasure and it's not there or the guy runs away from it. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is good. This is Value After Hours. We're actually managing to live stream this now, so hello to everybody who's listening in Kathmandu and Venezuela and all of the other places. J 
Jeff Gundlach's up on stage, so we're just going to wrap this up as quickly as we can and run up to <laughs> Jeff as well, you along think with everybody of, else. Uh, the Sherman show before, they were talking high yield. I, I think what he was saying is gross, you can get like 13% in a pool, and you figure net, you got 10. You know, 10% on debt used to be something. That's just a little bit over inflation now. It's like 1.1 1. 1. Yeah, 1.1 1. 1 real. real. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I guess the question comes down to how persistent is inflation going to be. If you could get 10 with duration on debt, I think that does pretty well from here. What was we, so we saw Romick interviewed yesterday by Meb. What was what was Romick's view? Uh, I don't know. Did he say excited. anything about inflation particularly? I don't think he was particularly excited about high yield though. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, I do think that's true. Because these guys are more. Okay, that, that's what they do all the time. They're yeah, full barbers time. and haircuts. Type yeah, thing. and then Romick sort of he can he can be there or not. He can be somewhere else. Yeah. I guess when I think about it, I think about it from, like, an overall personal portfolio. Like, I'm not – I don't know. I bet I bet 10% of debt outperforms a lot of equities, whether or not it outperforms, How you know, you? value or whatever. That's not – no, I'm not – I mean, this could be the gross shit that I'm talking about, right? Which, in you know, I don't know. I haven't done, like, a market cap weighted index construction. But if that pulls down the index enough, I could see high yield outperforming the index. Then again, you still got the five terra caps, and they are monsters. What do they do today when everything got beaten up? What? Oh, I don't know. Facebook was down seven percent when I looked, but I, I don't look at the market anymore. You're smart. You've yeah, as ascended just, to a higher with it. spiritual plane. I think so. Okay. Yeah, as place. most people that find a tough period start doing. I'm gonna start going on walks, <laughs> studying <laughs> stoicism, all of the other. I'm just earlier in my progression right now. But I, I don't know that it matters, right? Like, I, I do think, I think Facebook and Google, I mean, Jake, you said a, a couple podcasts ago, advertising is like a one and a half beta to the market. Mm. To the extent that they are now more of the market, they, sh you know, they should be more cyclical in the future. But like, I don't know, if Microsoft traded down today, they're just going to buy more shares. True. There are still ways to win, certainly, even in a falling market, if you can look through a little further. Yeah, and I think the other thing that, um, I don't know, it's kind of, it's so hard to be right short term, but I think that I'm, I'm more confident in on the back end is like, if we go into a tough spot, I just, how are you going to start a company that competes with, I mean, you can't compete with Microsoft anyway, but I just think the big gets stronger through real downturns. That's certainly historically been the case. Yeah, I think that's the theory for that's your mar that's your marijuana theory thesis, right? Yeah, is that yeah. is that true though? Because I was reading something that uh, the 1930s were actually some have argued like the most technological advancements happened in the 1930s as a very very difficult period, obviously for most people, and that you like you have to find new and innovative ways. It's like a forcing function. So, it, new and innovative meaning that garage thing that comes and disrupts whatever it is that was your cash cow. Does the absence of capital make it harder for startups or, or harder for the, the people who are generating free cash flow already? Uh, you know, I think the, the good ideas probably still get funded and then therefore maybe some of the less good ideas go, la go <laughs> lacking. This is kind of what I was asking uh, Steve yesterday about Charter. Right, where, you know, people have said, like, well, the stock is down so much, when do you know you're wrong? And I've in the past said if you're down 50%, you're wrong. So, like, trying to figure out when you're actually wrong is something that uh, I've spent time thinking about. What did you take from what he said? Well, I, the most important answer, I think, is he has his own KPIs. And I think that's the real answer. Now, you've got to be honest about, you know, how much they matter. Is to the moon a KPI? Uh, no, cable's not going to the moon right now. It's going oh. to zero, sir. Okay. Um, but I, I think, so the interesting thing about the game, right, is growth is objectively slower. Rates go higher. There are less homes delivered. That's less growth because cable's growth at this stage is probably going to come from homes being built as opposed to like, I mean, there's some incremental share to take, but it's not me a meaningful driver. It's more of a shower than a grower. 
That's right. Okay. Yes, at this stage. Um, but, you know, if rates are eight, which they're not, but like for the borrowing cost of some of the overbuilders, th they're north of that, I think. And then if inflation's running at six and the labor market's tight, like it gets harder to compete with an installed base. What about the size of the payment for people who are paying a mortgage where, where it, it's, it's essentially doubled in 12 months? Yeah, I, th I think that's a valid reason why housing hits the brakes and, uh, and the economy slows because the multiplier effect. I, I am a strong uh, proponent of the idea that what ends up happening is mobility is just really decreased because I, I think people buy a payment and a lot of those payments are fixed for 30 years. So like now you're really going to want to move. The double line guys felt that we're at peak margins. We've never had margins of 45 years. We've never they didn't had margins. Say peak. They said, they said, they, said margins they were at the biggest years. they've been in 45 years. So what does that take you back to? Like 1977 or something like yeah. that? That doesn't mean we're peaking. Could go higher. <laughs> Where does it come out of? I, I don't, dude, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I, I think I, one of the things that makes me um, pretty excited about where we are as an economy is I'm glad that labor is finally eating. I understand that there is a problem with what that does to financial assets and in the financial community that like scares us. But I, I think we do like nothing on average relative to most of society. So like if we have some pain after 20 good years, like, I don't know, kind of fuck us a little bit. Um, <laughs> Fair. So like, you know, as long as people are gainfully employed, um, I don't know that inflation is the thing that scares me the most. At some point, though, labor takes a bigger share of those margins. That pushes margins down a little bit. I think Jake has broken this down before, but we said, um, well, that man, that bit of man research that I was discussing a few weeks ago. So they say if, if earnings follow the trajectory that we have followed in the past over the next 12 months, you get to 190 earnings on the S&P 500, and I think it's like 210 or something at the moment. So Sounds it comes right. back a lot. And then the multiple that they put on that 190 of earnings, at the peak in 2020, 20, it was 23 times. And so that's up sort of 10% from here. Yeah. At the trough in 2000, that was 12 times, which was down, say, 40% from here. I find that risk-reward ratio across the market a little bit unnerving. Yeah. Particularly where we are, how far we've come down. Yeah. Uh... I don't. I don't know that I buy the peak mul or the trough multiple on trough earnings, but well, I, that's the I don't just extreme disagree with outcome. You. That's the worst case outcome. Yeah, it's not an impossibility though. No, well, it's twelve not. times. It's a very low probability though. I think even twenty times on a shiller is a thirty percent drop from here, and twenty times on shillers historically, well over the uh, sixteen. The average 17. is sixteen point six, something like that. Sixteen point yeah. seven. Yeah, I mean, look, multiples are not cheap, right? <laughs> I, I will agree with that. I, I don't know that they're going to... Um, it's like fucking predicting hocus pocus, right? But uh, I don't know that I think they're going to get cheap. We have, we have air to film it. We've got we've to do this sort of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I enjoy the conversations. They're just useless. Um, <laughs> uh, True. Yeah, I, I don't know. I do, I do agree that the, sh the risk reward, it's not like... I mean, we were talking about it last night. I have a slug of money that's like... If I really think that I can change my life to the upside, I'm going to bet this. I'm not itching to bet that slug of money right now at all. Uh, I'd much rather have liquidity in my life, and I'd much rather have the, the option value of cash than like, rush out to deploy that piece of capital. But I'm also not reducing the, the portion of my capital that I've allocated to compound for my life. I like one of the things that Romick said yesterday about... Um He's put on a half-size position or a smaller position, yeah. expecting that there's better likely some short-term... Yeah, there'll be better entry points. Yeah, I thought that that was a very artistic comment because I think it's easy to be, like, um, very precise on what you think the value should be and, like, wait until it gets to that and try to be as cheap as humanly possible. But I think what he was admitting in that strategy is, like, I can't catch the bottom. I think it's a decent buy here. And then if I do catch the bottom, I'll be there and ready. But, you know, I, I don't know. I like that answer a lot. I think it's better to be a carpet bomber in this kind of scenario as opposed to, like, trying to just nail 
a see. couple perfect buys. Just carpet bong them along. It's a time series. Like, just keep on buying. Yeah. Just keep buying as it goes lower. Get more for your money. And even if the last dollars you deploy are not at the peak, you know, very bottom, that's okay too. I mean, just try to get a lot of value for your money. Yeah. At the same time, you've got this spread between the market and the most undervalued stuff. So that the, uh, I always follow the Alpha Architect, Jess has left, but I always follow the Alpha Architect has a great screener where they show you the, the median for various different value metrics versus the market for those metri value metrics. And the EV EBIT spread was in, at the end of July, was as wide as it has ever been. It's closed up twice since through there, but it still continues to be as wide as it's ever been. At some point, if that closes, that generates a lot of return for value. I mean, that's... Is, is that what we're looking for? That's what's keeping me going at the moment. <laughs> that's the only thing keeping me going. Huh. Yeah. I don't know. I got to think about that. I mean, the, the tightest it was was like 2005. And so it's blown out for now 17 years. So at some point, if that turns, I mean, I don't even know what that would look like, but I imagine that would be a good feeling. Yeah, no, that would be nice. Value have a little win for a while. One almost doesn't even want to whisper it <laughs> into the, for How fear of jinxing. I sort of re referred to this before, but can you, do you remember the, the breakdown for margins, dividends? You're going to do that to me can right now. Yeah, yeah, can you do it? Uh, Roughly, in rough terms. Like where returns came from, yeah. from the last 10 years, call it? Yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, three hold, your, hold your mic up. You might saw be. a multiple expansion. It was a lot. So yeah. of the 16.6% annualized return that you got from the S&P 500 from 2011 to 2021, uh, roughly 3% was from revenue growth, which kind of falls in line with what you might expect from GDP, right? Um, margin expansion, I believe, was good for, I think, in the 3% range. Uh, tiny, like another one-ish percent, maybe a half a percent came from share count reduction. Uh, and then six and a half, I think, seven percent of it was from margin expansion. So everyone getting excited more for that, that business, basically. And that gave you the other six to get you to 16.6. .6. I mean, stuff that I think is really dangerous here, and I'm going to look like such a fucking idiot, uh, but like Costco, I mean... That stock does not intrigue me. Why? I understand why people pay it. I understand why it's durable. I, like, uh, but fundamentally, their model does not roll out stores quickly. So except, like, they're not going to accelerate growth. That's just not what they do. I, I mean, you pay for certainty. I kind of get that. And they are an inflation hedge, and I get that. But I can articulate a lot more reasons why that stock is dear than why it's going to have strong returns in the future. And I think, like, when you don't have a... Um, I don't deem their growth that big relative to their earnings base, and their multiple is quite large. You can, like, quickly turn around and you've lost five years of return because multiples have come in on you. Yeah, it's kind of a tip substitute almost, huh? Yeah. It's super easy to, earn, like, own. Like, I get it, but... And you're not going to get fired owning it, especially if you have taxable money. Yeah. But, like, I don't know, you put that up against some random value name, I would probably take, I'd definitely take the basket of value over that. One of the uh, points that Romick made yesterday in relation to Microsoft in particular, he said that from 2000 to 2000, and I forget what it was exactly, but 11 or 12, it grew earnings at 16.6% .6 compound for that entire period, and the stock was flat or down over that 11 years. And I don't know where it ended up finally bottoming, but it was 11 or 12. I think. It was 14, I think. Yeah, I think it took later, 14 so. years to go from, to finally basically grow into its valuation. Which is a point I've made a few times in relation to Walmart. So I think Costco is a reasonable um, example that's analogous to Walmart and also GE and a few of those. Everybody remembers 2000 as being a dot-com boom, but it affected everything. The entire market was trading at a, Shiller P. It was kind of a large four. cap boom as it was much a large as anything. Cap boom, yeah. And then all of those large caps, while they were very good businesses and they did continue to earn lots of money and did continue to grow very rapidly, took 15 years to kind of grow into their valuations. And I can see that, I can personally, I think that's what's about to happen for the next 10. Yeah. I, I can if you have rising rates. Yeah. 
I, I mean, I think that I think valuations are more reasonable now than they were in that you know in that Microsoft example. But um, I don't know, like something like Costco. I think I think it's a great like stay wealthy stock. But when I say wealthy, I mean I I don't think that like Charlie Munger wealthy, right? Like he can afford he, he if can it afford doesn't go anywhere f- for like five or ten years. What's it matter? He still wants to own Costco over the long term. I mean, he's got a long I, timeline from here. So Charlie's gonna be okay. But you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying, though. Like, I think if you're looking to get wealthy, getting wealthy in a stock like Costco would scare me here. So which one do you buy to get wealthy? Yeah, where do we go? I don't know. I think you got to go hairier than Costco. Like what? I don't know, man. Give me some lumber names. No, <laughs> I, I wouldn't mess with that. I Look, I mean, you know, we'll see if I'm right or wrong, but I think Charter, I think, you know, we'll see. What do you make of the fact that you can, p- you can pick just about any chart and you can look at lumber, you can look at gold, you can look at growth stocks, and you can see that they've all had this big run-up. Round trip. Yeah, and they've all come back. What's the, what's the mechanic that causes that to happen? Flows. Capitalism. Is it capitalism? I think so. The Fed? No, yeah. no. Not, no, but just rising prices create their own new supply. We've got some questions here, fellas. Oh. Uh, Where do you see value in ESG? Oh, I don't. I actually... In the G. No, I, I'm kidding. I don't know about finding value in ESG, but I did hear about an interesting company that takes... They go through and they look at like the energy density of a company, like how much energy do they use in their processes... And then they look at the promises that they've made about when they're going to get to some ESG target, and they basically build an offsheet liability as to like how bad news it's going to be for them, and then they sell that data onto hedge funds. I thought that was actually really smart. I'm kind of jealous that I didn't think of that. It's a good idea. It yeah. is a really good idea. I like Romick's comments yesterday where he said, uh, if you treat the environment or your community or your employees badly, then you create this off-balance sheet liability that there's this contingent liability that at some stage someone comes along and they do something to, they sue you into submission or you get regulated and that hurts your returns. And so there are good, aside from it being the right thing to do, there are good um, business incentives for behaving as if it is the right thing to do. Yeah. And it, it sures up your terminal value to be like ESG in the right way. I think ESG gets a bad name because people have turned it into a marketing tool and it's kind of bullshit. But like when done the right way, I know it's N- shocking that finance would do that. But like your, your, um, your concept of the invincible company, right? Like, I don't know if you want to touch on that, but like I would define that as ESG and I yeah. bet it would certainly, if you could buy it at a reasonable multiple, that would be my definition of value. Yeah. My idea of an invincible company is just one that follows ESG rules for the reasons that it won't get sued or won't get, attract attention from other people. No, come on, though. There's more to it than that. Like, there's a, a nobility. What's well, being in harmony with the world. Like, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. it's being aligned with, get, like, get your philosophical on us, like, Yeah, come on, man. Uh, it's a, it might be, Can we just smoke the joint? We're right at the beach. There's, <laughs> there's this great backdrop here. It's hard to... It's hard to I'll, I'll write it all down. I'll let everybody know. <laughs> Let's do the next one. In a book. <laughs> where, where do you think investors are mistaking value for jumping into early? Do you mean, like, what... Uh, what sector or what industry or, or just uh, what price? Who knows? Where do you think inve- well, we can just make it up. Where do you think investors are mistaking value for jumping in too early? Um, I think that mistakes that I have made in the past have always been in uh, basic materials and in commodity type businesses that um, have a high yield and the yield turns out to be illusory and everybody knew that except for me. Yeah. So this is where I think a a quantitative approach is called for and position sizing is the real answer for this because if you own a basket of all of those, I think that there's a couple that will defy what everyone knew that this was a shit business. And when it does, it's so asymmetric that it makes up for all of your sins and that's how you win. I like the way that sounds. I'd like to see that happen. (laughs) I think uh, if you're to ask- Works in theory, I don't know about practice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, uh, the next, like, th- three years, what factor do I like the most? Uh, it would be small cap value. And what type of companies do I like? It would be U.S.-focused cyclicals. Uh, so if 
that turns out to be wrong because of a cyclical miscalculation, that would be an example of people thinking there's value in being early. When you say small cap value, you just said cyclicals. Yeah. That's basically what they yeah. are. I mean, a little bit of quality. Yeah. I, I think uh, small has been beaten to shit. Uh, and I think a lot of that's just liquidity driven and funds flow driven. And that's uh, as long as the businesses don't get hurt, I think the stocks are going to do really well, which is maybe an obvious thing to say. Well, the entire world is large cap US based companies. And then anything that's not large US based or growth, I guess. Not that, not that the large caps are growth, but they're, they're sort of, there's a momentum feature to them. Yeah. And anything that's not that has suffered to anything that's small, value, international, looks terrible by comparison. It's probably due for a pretty good run. Yeah, Europe it would probably actually be... I, I could see European value having a decent run out of here, but I just don't know when. Yeah, it makes you shudder. It's disgusting. <laughs> that's how value works. <laughs> uh, WBD down 40% from when Bill wasn't enthused about it. Value here. What's uh, WBD? Yeah, what is that? It's Warner Brothers Discovery. Yeah. Uh, I just don't... I, it's... Uh, it's not an investment for me. I, I just think they have, uh, they've got a lot of debt. They've got a CEO that used to extol the virtues of a sportsless bundle. Now that he has sports, he loves sports. You're using legacy cash flows from an ice cube, trying to cut your way to wealth. Like I, I, I think Netflix is the easiest story to understand. And uh, I, I'm more interested in Paramount or uh, or like, Comcast spinning out NBCU. I, I think Comcast is probably, if I had to put money into a media asset right now, I think Comcast is probably the one that I'd pick. What about Netflix? Uh, I think it can really work from here. I, mm. I, it's not as cheap as Comcast, and I don't know that uh, my perception of cheap, but I'm also a, a broadband bull, so maybe I'm just wrong. Um, I, I, yeah, I think Netflix could do well. I don't know where I'd sell it. Um, but I, I think you could probably own it for a long time. From Never there. sell? Well, there's a point where you have to sell okay. it. But. What about the debt on Netflix? How do they resolve that? Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> I Is mean, they got, they got cash flow now. They can roll that debt. They're fine. You don't think they've got content spend that is, you know, not, none of that content ages particularly well. Yeah, but neither do podcasts. I, I think... Um, <laughs> I think what they are, like, I think they've recreated a low-cost bundle without sports, which is ironically what David Zaslav always said would do really well. Uh, and I think that they now have created, like, basically a studio that has guaranteed subscription revenue, which is a far superior business model to traditional studios. So now, like, all that they really have to do is figure out how to spend $17 billion efficiently, which... Like, seems like not the hardest problem in the world to solve for. Um, so I, I, and there's also, I mean, Evan Tindell in the podcast that's coming up on mine, uh, he explains it well. Like, you, you've got the transition to uh, owned content, so the, the cash flow dynamics are different. I think amortization and free cash flow start to, like, converge. I, they're going to be fine. What do I you think. make, we've got a very big sell-off today as a result of, a, a terrible inflation print? Is that the, is that the That's most proximate Word cost? on the street. Yeah. Would it come in 8.3 year was, over year? It was 0 0.1 for, for June or July, or August. <laughs> well, how far zero. back do we look? Yeah. How far back are the, uh, is the information? Huh? I saw that, I saw that uh, Joe Weisenthal said that uh, he is focusing on the 12-month figure. Oh. So I don't know if you saw last month he was arguing that you know, it was a 0% print. He was like, therefore, there's no inflation. <laughs> Oh, now he likes the 12-month figure? Yeah. I like Joe. Joe's good at Twitter like that. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. Joe's the final boss on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, that panel over there was talking inflation. Everybody loves inflation right now. It's the, it's the sexy girl at the dance, for lack of a better term. It would be funny if inflation had completely gone away and we're hiking into dis disinflation or deflation. I think that's part of why stocks are selling off. I think the... F the market is where the Fed is going to make a mistake and break something, but I don't know. These All are right. hard questions. Well, I've got a question for you. What originally got you interested in value investing? Uh, mine's pretty easy because I happened to win a 
lottery to go back and have lunch with Warren Buffett in my first year of <laughs> business school. So that was, that was a bit of a, a gimme from the universe. How old were you? Uh, 25, maybe. But what was funny about it is like once I started reading about him and I, I said, wait a second, he just likes to not pay retail for something. He just likes to get a deal. I've been doing that my whole life. Of course it makes sense in the context of partial ownership of businesses as much as it does me buying a kayak on Craigslist and selling it on eBay for more. Like it, it was the same game, it's just a different application of it. So I felt, felt very comfortable. Little did I know that, like you, Toby, that I was a, a very momentum, momentum, value, yeah, momentum value guy getting sucked in at the top of when it had just had a terrific run. Um, so, which I think that's pretty natural. I think it, if you get in, interested in investing, you should almost default think, I've got to be the last person that knows about this. Yeah. Because chances are just the news flow, like statistically, you probably are late to the game. So... Take that with a grain of salt if you're a newer investor. What about you, Billy? Uh, it's the first pursuit other than women that I really fell in love with. <laughs> How old were you? Uh, older than I was when I fell in love with women. I, I probably like 24 uh, when I really started to get into it. And I don't know. It's something that uh, I still don't think I understand. So it's nice that every day you learn something and unlearn something. Yeah, I was, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I was at university in Australia and a friend of mine said, uh, Warren Buffett is the richest man in the world and he's an in he runs an insurance company. And I thought, well, I don't care anything about insurance. And they said, no, he writes these letters where he explains what he does. And so I went and read the letters and I thought, oh, this kind of makes sense. I think I can do this, like having no idea <laughs> whatsoever. And so now I am 43 years old and I go back and I look at the things that I've read those letters 20 times, maybe more than that. I go back and I read them and I, now I understand what he meant. Every single time I do it, I miss something that I, I didn't pick up the first time through. So I, I like that about investing, that you continue to learn as you get older. Like everybody says that, but it is true. You really don't know everything at any stage and then you die. No. Do we really have 17 minutes left? I think that went up, didn't it? I thought there was like less than 15 for a moment. I mean, I don't mind. Stretch it out. I just didn't know if time was going slow. Do you have any more I veggies? did have one of these California edibles before I came, <laughs> which could be why. Um, time's gone. You really know, the, the interesting thing about, uh, about investing to me and like value and whatnot is, uh, you know, it applies throughout, right? So you've got real estate and like some guys are slumlords, some guys make money and like, and, and gals, I shouldn't say just guys. Uh, anyway, the, the girls were, were hoping that you would include them in the slumlord discussion. Yeah, they to yeah, don't yeah. forget me. Problem: Real estate's a very broy industry too, so there really aren't that many women. Anyway, uh, then there's like high-end designers, um, and I I think uh, or high-end developers, and I think like investing is the same. Like you can find these guys that specialize in luxury goods, and and they may not pay you know a statistically cheap price, but it is value within the what they search within, right? And now some of that, uh, some of their performance is going to be tied to how luxury as a factor does. So is that, an, is that an argument for being a generalist then? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think there are times when a generalist can zoom out and see which factor to avoid. So don't be a slumlord all the time. Yeah, that's right. Just when the going's good. Yeah, and I also think, uh, you know, the concept of, like, sleep-adjusted return is something that I like a little bit more, right? Like, maybe I don't earn as much as humanly possible here, but I can sleep at night. I think Charlie Munger said something like that where he, he said, we used to sort of stoop down and buy the really cheap stuff, but we don't do that anymore, and our returns haven't gone down that much. Yeah. So I was like, oh. And I guess there's a point that you get to where you've made so much money, you just, like, at this point, it's about comfort. Yeah, I think that's right. It's about sleeping. Where do you see value in the foreign markets? Are certain countries more attractive sectors? You do a little bit more international than everybody else. Yeah, sometimes against my better judgment. Um, I, you know, I think Japan is still probably the most interesting. You have uh, going on now, what, 30 plus years of pretty rough economic times there, relatively speaking. from from the position of dominance in the late 80s that they were like taking over the world. Um, and you had a lot of corporate government governance issues that were 
really impacting returns on equity for businesses in Japan. And as that has started to turn over, I think, with a new generation and a uh, new shareholder base who now recognizes, hey, we have also have to make some money as shareholders here. Like, we can't just run these for the employees or for kind of for society. Kind of yeah. Um, you know, they'll, I think they'll start to unlock more value in different ways, whether it's buybacks or uh, dissolving some of these cross-holding things that complicate uh, how, you know, what do you actually own in a Japanese business. And you have just a pretty bombed out valuation to start, and that's usually a good place to start fishing. So I like Japan right now. To what extent have American activists been successful in Japanese industry? Not much at all. Yeah. My understanding is. I think there's been a few wins here and there. And, but you know what? This is like, um, like Planck said about science. Like it progresses one death at a time. And I think you know, the corporate governance Japan will probably progress one death at a time as well. Do you think that Japan really has been as bad as that economically, or is it more just it was so overvalued in the 90s, it was at a 100 times cyclically adjusted PE, and I've just had to work that off. It is takes that high? 30 years to work. <laughs> I'm sure. With very little growth, right? It's not like a super diverse economy. But it's still a very big economy. And yeah, no doubt, huge, but they yeah. didn't have, the demographics were not on their side. And they invented QE. Yeah. I don't think that helped a lot either. But the... They just needed a little bit more every time. <laughs> they just didn't quite do enough, right? Isn't it, that the it argument? It is always the way, yeah. Okay. One of the things, you know, coming from Australia, I'm familiar with the Australian index. The Canadian index is the same. It's heavily dominated by banks. It's like 50% financials. Then there's another 15% that's basic materials. And so if, as an investor, you're trying to get diversification, it's hard to get enough consumer discretionary, those kind of businesses where... The U.S. is almost unique in producing those sort of businesses, but Japan does have some, too. So Japan produces them, which makes Japan more interesting, I think, than a lot of other destinations as yeah. a quality. You get a Toyota, you get a, a Honda in Japan, whereas a lot of other places, you don't get a company Sony. like that. Yeah. Yeah, Nintendo. Nintendo. Yeah, yeah, they got some... Yeah. SoftBank. Yeah. SoftBank. <laughs> I think uh, Massa came out and he said I was a little bit overexcited <laughs> I got up there. Did he say their, that? Their yeah. eyes were a little shinier than I, than I recognized. <laughs> had a little bit of Sanpaku at the top there, I think. Oof. Yeah. I like the presentation with the up arrows and the unicorns. That one was great. Yeah, and the golden egg producing more unicorns. Yeah, bloop, bloop, that's bloop, pretty bloop. sweet. Would be a nice vision. Um, <laughs> I don't know. My, my, I feel like European industrials if you actually know what you're doing, is probably a good hunting ground, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I got smoked on AB InBev not understanding currency, so I'm not sure that I love that risk. That has been one that's been hurting the Japan trade, is the yen is really dumped against the dollar. I mean, everything has against the dollar, but you, the yen has been rough if you've owned... If you've been earning in yen, it's been bad news for you if you spend in dollars. Yeah. Yeah. The yen has been surprisingly strong against the US dollar for a long period of time. It's dumped recently, but yeah. it's been, it's one of the things that I looked at before. You remember that like a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, there was like a, there was a net, there was a, a boom in net nets in Japan and everybody, you, you, I think you got the net net trade on in Japan, didn't you? I bought a lot in Japan in 2011 after Fukushima. 10 years, it was Fukushima. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there was a lot to scoop up there. It kind of felt obvious at the time. Not too many of those that you, in your... <laughs> Not enough Fukushimas. Yeah, well, <laughs> you hate to say that, right? But <laughs> sometimes. We've only got 10 minutes to fill. I bought so that too. Did it you? Was, it was impossible not to buy that. What did you buy? Net nets? I, no, I just bought uh, an index, but it was like... It was like Fukushima's not going to end Japan. And people were acting as if it was. I mean, I bought a, I bought a basket of... 30 different companies that had been profitable for 10 years in a row that were trading for less than the cash that existed on the balance sheet after backing all the liabilities out. So you have productive assets trading for literally less than, than cash on the balance sheet. Yeah. Kind of felt obvious. It's a shitty thing to say, but like I, <laughs> I can see myself go. buying a property after a big hurricane, stuff like that. Is that why you moved to Florida? No. Boots on the ground? <laughs> I did it at the wrong time. Now oh, okay. I'm along a lot of real estate before the big hurricane, which is not how you want to do things. <laughs> what other investing styles intrigue you? Mm. Let what me about think about growth? that for a second. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, c I could see uh, up I up and to the right. Is that a yeah. style? Yeah, I, I don't know which one that is. Yeah, I'd trend love to following. Find that one. Oh. I mean, that makes sense to me. I understand trend following. I know enough about markets to know they trend. What about growth? You, you sort of flirted, uh, flirting, open mind to it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I just think that you, I, I think that historically focused, uh, being focused on multiples has made me make cognitive <laughs> errors where I wanted to see things as I wanted them to be because the multiple was cheap. Uh, you know, growth has, uh, I guess, different biases attached, right? You're dreaming up a fantastic future or something like that. But I'm just hoping that by learning from some of the growth of your guys, I can try to help myself see the world as it is. I, I don't, I would never like, I don't know, some of these people that are valuation agnostic, I think it's fucking crazy. But whatever, like they can. Does it work for the quality guys to be valuation agnostic? I don't think so. I, th I think real quality guys, I, th I, think you, I think you have to redefine what your perception of valuation, like the range that something will trade in, right? So like Costco, right? I, I think, uh, but I don't think you can be valuation agnostic, right? If it's a 0.5% free cash flow yield, it's a sell. Now, you know, where does that happen? I don't know. Maybe it's two. Maybe you say, I'd rather own Costco equity than, you know, a government bond. Like, I have no idea. But what I do know is there's some point where you have to say this valuation doesn't make sense. I'm changing my answer to, to tail risk. <coughs> I'm interested in tail risk. Yeah. Hedging, specifically. Very expensive right now, but um, that idea of being, getting a nice slug of capital at the bottom, and that's where the real value of it is, is not so much the protection on the downside, but the ability to go longer at the bottom, and, and that, that bite at the apple is, I think, like kind of underrated. And I'm, I'm actually surprised that more fund managers don't look at that as a business continuity insurance policy for them. I don't know that that's what they're paid to do. Well. If you're an allocator, allocators should have it. But if I had like a fund manager that I was allocating to, I don't know that I'd want them putting on tail risk. It's expensive. Well, yeah, and I think I'd view that as almost my own job as an allocator as opposed to their job. That's fair. I guess I'm always thinking about like managing the entirety of the net worth and what do you do to protect it. And yeah. I don't think about sleeves as much. Yeah. The, the thesis that Taleb had in uh, his first book, not, not the Black Fooled by Randomness. Fooled by Randomness was that we sort of under under price risk, right? And so this tail, anything right out in the tails gets overpaid, which would seem to fly in the face of all the research that existed beforehand, which said there's this volatility smile that the edges have a lot more probability. Uh, people overpay for the edges. But then he got such a quick payoff after the book came out, he got 2008-9, so it looked kind of prescient at the time. Yeah, that was good. But now that we've had such a long drought between that getting paid yeah. and you know any kind of event like i don't think vol's been paid for a really long period of time i mean you got 2020 yeah they got paid? got paid right on that cds trade that he made and that gave him a lot of dry powder to buy a lot of quality i mean i took like guys like chris cole who's also a vol guy like they they were getting ready for that event they were ready for the giant payoff and the, they were loaded into that and then it didn't come it got because it bounced so quickly. It and it hasn't uh. happened for the 2022 for these guys either. I mean, yeah. when, the, when the market just goes down a little bit every day and VIX stays in the you know, range bound below 20 to 30, I don't think those guys are getting paid. Uh, good, good question here. Biggest wins, biggest regrets. I've never had a win, but I've got plenty of regrets. So you guys take the wins. It's the friends we made along the way. <laughs> I don't know. I do. I've got, I've got a good regret, and this is, this is a real one, and this is the one I say a lot. I'm trying to say it out loud enough that it'll like finally drill into my head, but Jake and I had this discussion. Jake wrote an article in 2014, I think it was, showing that the value spread was as tight as it had ever been, or going back 25 years, and he said this will be the worst opportunity set for 25 years. And I read that article, and I reposted it on my little blog, Greenbacked, and I, and I 
wrote it, I completely understood what he said. And then I just kept on doing what I was doing. And it turned out that Jake was exactly right. And it was the worst opportunity set for value for 25 years. And then it followed on. There was 10 years of miserable performance for value. What if I wouldn't have written it? Would that then... Uh but now it would have never happened? Maybe I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now I feel like the fact that the spread is so wide that that's a positive thing. And I think that if you wrote an article now that said the, val the value spread is the best, maybe I've got to write that article, the value spread is the best it's been in 25 years. You should write that article. I think that's true. Cliff writes that article. As does. That's true. In order for the but magic it's be to one occur, of the I've got to yeah. make the spell happen. That makes sense. That Jake makes might have to write it and I might have no, to repost it. That logic checks out. Yeah. For the yeah. universe to let it happen. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think one of my bigger wins is going to be this house we're building. I bought that, I bought that land at the right time uh, in a big way. This is your, um, your crocodile farm that you're yeah, building? Yeah, that's <laughs> fucking bull sharks and crocodiles in the backyard. But despite that, it's still a very nice place. Um, and I don't know. My regret is that I kind of wish that I found this stuff earlier in life. Um, I think... Uh, it's a shame it took so long, but whatever. I didn't have a whole lot of mentors, so I'll blame everyone around me rather than owning it. <laughs> I, I do have a win, but it's kind of like a backdoor win. There was this, uh, there was this company, it was in California, it was a biotech, and it, I can't remember the exact details, but it had about $2 in cash and it was trading at 70 cents and it had an activist who I knew who was trying to bust it open and get them to pay out the cash. But they had this drug uh, with the FDA for approval. I forget what phase, but one or two or something like that. And uh, the activists were making pretty good headway with these guys, and it looked like they were going to pay out the cash, which was a triple, which would have been really nice because it was 2008, eight nine around that kind of period. And then uh, the FDA approved the drug, and it traded from $0.70 cents to $7. So the thesis was completely wrong, but it worked out. I'd, lo I'd love some more of those. Yeah, how do you get to be right for all the wrong reasons? Yeah. That's, the, that's the money ticket. That's, huh? that's a real win. Just ask the recent bears. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Hey, thanks so much, uh, guys, for coming out and watching. I'm overwhelmed by the, the size of the crowd. You guys, <laughs> been, you guys have been awesome. And I appreciate that you guys gave up Gundlach. Yeah, I don't know that I'd have nice. made that trade. So thanks so much for coming over. Yeah, um, this we is like when Bezos went and was eating McDonald's, you know, for everybody to it see. Is that it's bad. like a regular guy. <laughs> I'll tell you bad. what, I'm open to making this our official podcast location. This is a good spot. It's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. This is the I conference has been great. This. Thanks, folks.